Hello everyone, this is Mr. Caviani, and by the end of this video, you should be able to apply Newton's second law to solve problems involving inclined planes. Because an inclined plane is really nothing more than a surface at an angle, let's revisit our force diagram for a box resting on a flat surface. I'll skip the interaction diagram as we've drawn these several times before, but I know that there are two forces acting on a box at rest on the ground. The normal force from the surface pointing up, and the gravitational force on the box pointing down. And I want to remind everyone that we call the normal force the normal force because if we look at the direction of the force relative to the surface, it forms a right angle uh, with the flat surface. And so we're going to apply this same idea to a box on what we call an inclined plane, which is really just a hill. If we're given a box on some hill on the right here, and we're given the angle of the hill, um, we can draw the same forces acting on this box. And in this case, there will also be some uh, friction, either static or kinetic, keeping the box from sliding down the hill if it's static, or if it's kinetic, the box would be sliding down the hill. Now, let's draw our normal force and gravitational force just like before. The gravitational force will still point straight down like always. Now, in this case, the surface is not flat. So if I were to draw a line that's parallel to the surface of the hill, the normal force will be perpendicular to the hill. In other words, the normal force will point out like this, forming a right angle with the inclined plane. So this would be my normal force. So a bit different in this case, the normal force is not opposite the gravitational force. So we know that they're not going to be equal in this case. Now, if the box is sliding down the hill, or if there's enough static friction to keep the box motionless, in either case, I know that the force of friction will act in this direction, opposite the direction of attempted or actual motion. For now, I'll just label that as friction. Now that my force diagrams are complete, I want to point out an interesting difference. In the normal example with a box on a flat surface, I normally define my coordinate system like this, where y is straight up and x is to the right. And normally this is fine because most of our forces are either vertical or horizontal. Now, if I apply the same coordinate system here for the inclined plane, we run into a bit of an issue. We notice that the only force that's acting in the y or x direction is the force of gravity, right? The frictional force and the normal force are both pointing at in angles relative to the coordinate system that we've defined. So we'd have to break both of them up into components. That also means the box would be accelerating in both the x and y directions. To make everything a lot easier on ourselves, when we deal with inclined planes, we're actually going to tilt our coordinate system so that the x direction is parallel to the hill and the y direction is perpendicular to the hill, like this. I'll just take my coordinate system and rotate it like so. There we go. And so now I see that I'm calling movement down the hill, the positive x direction, and I'm calling the direction pointing perpendicular, right, or up and up and down, so this, this kind of direction. That's going to be my y direction, and this is my x direction. So what do I see now? Well, now the force of friction is in the x direction, right, this is x, and the force of the normal force is in the y direction. Now the only force that's at an angle is the gravitational force. So I'm going to draw my force diagram now, uh, given this new tilted coordinate system, by drawing the components of the force of gravity. I'll begin by breaking the force of gravity into a y component like this, point straight down, here. It looks like about there, and an x component as well. So I can label them as well. Um, I'll go ahead and call this force of gravity in the y direction, and I'll call this one force of gravity in the x direction, right? Again, uh, given that x is the direction parallel to the hill, and y is the direction perpendicular to the hill, as I've defined it. Now, in order to solve for fgy and fgx, I kind of need to know this theta value, right? Now, let me prove to you how this theta value is related to the theta of the hill itself, or the angle of incline. If I were to look at this diagram, I would see that if this is theta, then this angle must be 90 minus theta. And that's because if I extend this force of gravity right here, you would see that 
because the force of gravity is pointing straight down, this forms a right triangle where the two complementary angles must add up to 90, given that this is a right triangle. So if this is theta, then this must be 90 minus theta, which means that this angle must also be 90 minus theta, right? Because these are uh, opposite angles um, formed by the same two lines. So in this triangle, right, this is a right angle right here. And if this is 90 minus theta, then this angle actually ends up being the same theta. So the angle that is formed by the components of gravity is the same angle as the hill. Therefore, I can write out an expression for each of these components of gravity. If I know that the force of gravity on any object is equal to the mass of that object times my acceleration due to gravity, a constant g, then I can express the force of gravity in the y direction as the adjacent side as mg cosine theta. I can similarly express the x component as mg sine of theta because it's the opposite side to this angle uh, shown here. Therefore, I can redraw my force diagram showing these components instead of the main force of gravity. I'll do that on the next slide. So on the left, we see the force diagram that we just drew out together. Uh, notice that I've also expressed the force of friction here as well. I know that the force of friction, either static or kinetic, depending on the problem, will be the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force. Uh, so that's the only other expression that we have, right? We don't have an expression for the normal force, but we do have an expression for the y component, x component of gravity. What I've done then is on the right-hand side here, I've gone ahead and removed the force of gravity, showing only the x and y components of the force of gravity instead. And notice I've moved the x component up so that it is in the center of the force diagram, which is totally fine to do because these are vectors again, so you can move them around. Okay. Now we're going to use Newton's second law with this force diagram on the right-hand side to sum all the forces in the x and y directions. It's important to note here that the reason the box slides down the hill then is because of this x component of gravity. And so the reason that you see objects on hills start to slide in the first place, right? There's no force being applied to them by any person or agent. Um, it's the force of gravity acting in the x direction, which in this case is down the hill. The next step in our problem solving process is always to write out the sum of forces in both the x or horizontal and y or vertical directions, um, indicating in this case down the hill as positive and uh, perpendicular upwards from the hill as a positive y direction. So in this case, if I were to add all of the forces in the x direction on the box, that would be the x component of gravity, fgx, minus the force of friction. Again, calling down the hill positive and up the hill negative. I can express this as well in terms of mg, this is sine theta, right, because that is the x component. And then also, uh, the force of friction will be the coefficient of friction times the normal force. That is the sum of my forces in the x direction. And I know that this will be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in the x direction, right? That always holds true. Now, I want an expression for the normal force. I don't want to just write the normal force. So in order to do that, I'm going to look at the y direction now, or what we call the perpendicular direction. I'm going to say that the sum of forces in this direction, it will be the normal force minus, in this case, the y component of gravity is the only force opposing the normal force. And I know as always that the sum of forces is always equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its acceleration, which in this case is zero because the block is not accelerating vertically or in the perpendicular direction. So then that leaves me with the expression that the normal force must be equal to the gravitational force in the y direction, right? If we were to move this fgy over to both sides, we would get this expression. So what that means is that the normal force is equal to, not mg, but mg cosine theta. So I'm going to take this expression for the normal force and substitute it in here for the x sum, and I would get an expression that looks like this. The sum of forces in the x direction is equal to mg sine theta 
minus mu, the coefficient of friction, multiplied by mg cosine theta. Make sure that you make your mu and your m uh, different. And that's going to be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in the x direction. So now that you've drawn your force diagram, we've redrawn the force diagram, and we've written out the sum of forces in both the horizontal and vertical directions, you're ready to start solving problems. It's as simple as that. Please take a look at my next video for example problems involving inclined planes.